I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. You're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. The climactic scene where Toto pulls back the curtain to reveal a nervous, tragic man pretending to be the great and powerful Oz represents more than just a classic moment in American cinematic history. Rather, it also gave us a metaphor for looking at masculinity in a new way, not as a fixed, inevitable state of being, but rather as a projection, a pose, a guise, an act, a mask that men often wear to uh, shield our vulnerability and hide our humanity. This mask can take a lot of forms, but one that's really important to look at in our culture at the millennium is what I call the tough guys. The front that so many men put up that's based on an extreme notion of masculinity that emphasizes toughness and physical strength and gaining the respect and admiration of others through violence or the implicit threat of it. Boys and young men learn early on that being a so-called real man means you have to take on this tough guys. In other words, you have to show the world only certain parts of yourself that the dominant culture has defined as manly. You can find out what those qualities are if you just listen to young men themselves. A real man is physical. Strong. Independent. He's powerful. Physical. Intimidating. Strong. Independent. In control. Rugged. Scares people. Powerful. Respected. Hard. A stud. Athletic. He's muscular. A real man is tough. 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 And just as most young men know what our culture expects of a so-called real man, they also know very well what you get called if you don't measure up. You get called a pussy, a bitch. He's a fag, queer, soft. You're a little mama's boy. Emotional, girly. He's a wimp. Bitch, queer. You get called weak, wuss. Sissy, fag, a fag. Fag. You're a fag. So for boys, and this is true for every racial and ethnic background and every socioeconomic group, to be a real man, to be tough, strong, independent, respected, means fitting into this narrow box that defines manhood. The terms that are the opposite of that, wuss, wimp, fag, sissy, are insults that are used to keep boys boxed in. So if you're a boy, it's pretty clear there's a lot of pressure on you to conform, to put up the act, to be just one of the guys. So the next question is, where do boys learn this? Obviously, they learn it in many different places. They learn from their families, their community. But one of the most important places they learn it is the powerful and pervasive media system, which provides a steady stream of images that define manhood as connected with dominance, power, and control. This is true across all racial and ethnic groups, but it's even more pronounced for men of color because there is so little diversity of images of them to begin with in the media culture. For example, Latino men are almost always presented either as boxers, criminals, or tough guys in the barrio, and Asian American men are disproportionately portrayed as martial artists or violent criminals. But transcending race, what the media do is help to construct violent masculinity as a cultural norm. In other words, violence isn't so much a deviation as it is an accepted part of masculinity. We have to start examining this system and offering alternatives because one of the major consequences of all of this is that there's been a growing connection made in our society between being a man and being violent. In fact, some of the most serious problems in contemporary American society, especially those connected with violence, can be looked at as essentially problems in contemporary American masculinity. For example, over 85% of the people who commit murder are men, and the women that do often do so as a defense against men who are battering them. 90% of people who commit violent physical assault are men. 95% of serious domestic violence is perpetrated by males, and it's been estimated that one in four men will use violence against a partner in their lifetime. Over 95% of dating violence is committed by men, and very often it's young men in their teens. Studies have found that men are responsible for between 85 and 95% of child sexual abuse, whether the victim is female or male. And 99.8% of people in prison convicted of rape are men. What this shows is that an awful lot of boys and men are inflicting an incredible level of pain and suffering, both on themselves and on others. And we know that much of the violence is cyclical, that many boys who are abused as children grow up and become perpetrators themselves. 
So calling attention to the way that masculinity is connected to these problems is not anti-male. It's just being honest about what's going on in boys and men's lives. And while women have been at the forefront of change and trying to talk about these issues in the culture, it's not just women who will benefit if men's lives are transformed. In fact, while men commit a shameful level of violence against women in our society, statistically speaking, the major victims of men's violence are other males. There are millions of male trauma survivors walking around today, men who were bullied as adolescents or abused physically or sexually as children. Thousands more men and boys are murdered or assaulted every year, usually by other men. So men have a stake in dealing with these problems, and not just those of us who have been victims, but also those men who are violent or who have taken on the tough guys. They do so also at the expense of their emotional and relational lives. More detail and a profile developing of kids who kill kids. One of the things that happens in typical discussions about social problems is that the very way we talk about the problems tends to obscure some of the root causes. For example, violence is not typically talked about as a gender issue, but the fact is that one gender, men, perpetrate approximately 90% of the violence. Now, part of the reason for this is that because men are the dominant group, and one of the ways dominance functions is through being unexamined. This is true for other areas as well. For example, when we hear the word race in the United States, we tend to immediately think African American, Latino, Asian American, Native American, etc. When we hear the term sexual orientation, we tend to think gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. When we hear the term gender, we tend to think women. In each case, the dominant group, white people, heterosexual people, men, don't get examined, as if men don't have a gender, as if white people don't belong to some racial grouping, as if heterosexual people don't have some sort of sexual orientation. In other words, we focus always on the subordinated group and not on the dominant group. And that's one of the ways that the power of dominant groups isn't questioned, by remaining invisible. There are a number of ways this happens. For example, the linguist Julia Penelope talks about how the use of the passive voice when we talk about crimes against women tends to shift our focus off of male perpetrators and onto female victims and survivors. For example, we talk about how many girls were raped last year, how many women were assaulted, or how many women were slain, as opposed to saying how many men raped women or girls, or how many boys or men assaulted and murdered women. Another way that we can see this idea about the invisibility of masculinity being played out is in the discussion about so-called youth violence. You read headlines in newspapers all around the country about this problem of kids killing kids. But after 10 school shootings in three years, there is more detail and a profile developing of kids who kill kids. But this isn't kids killing kids. Overwhelmingly, it's boys killing boys and boys killing girls. An example of the way the media degenders discussion of violence can be seen in the coverage of the Jonesboro, Arkansas massacre in the spring of 1998. There were all these headlines about kids killing kids and children killing children and what's going on with our kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In fact, one article in the New York Times, a think piece that was a step back piece to try to discuss the whole issue of all this range of school shootings, in one parenthesis said, all of these shootings were done by boys, and then what was in the parentheses wasn't discussed in the rest of the article. So you have a whole article trying to pull together all the different factors that are causing these shootings, and the one most important, in my opinion, is in the parentheses and not discussed.